Chris Tudge is a full professor in the biology department at American University, Washington, D.C., where he has been teaching for 20 years. He is a marine biologist and invertebrate biologist specializing in crustacean reproduction. His research focuses on the internal and external reproductive morphology of crustaceans, and in particular decapods such as crabs, shrimps, and lobsters, and how it relates to their shared evolution. He has been publishing on hermit crab reproductive biology since he was a graduate student in 1990 and has amassed more than 80 published papers in scientific journals since this time. He currently has active research collaborations with colleagues in Brazil and Germany on decapod reproduction and conservation, and in Iran on the descriptive taxonomy of new mud shrimp species. He has been a member of the International Crustacean Research Group, the Crustacean Society, TCS, since he was a graduate student and previously held several executive positions in TCS. He is currently on the editorial board of an Iranian biodiversity journal, Journal of Animal Diversity, and is the editor-in-chief of the crustacean journal, Nauplius, the flagship journal of the Brazilian Crustacean Society. He is also a keen naturalist and bird enthusiast, bird watching at every opportunity. Please welcome Chris Tudge. Just thought I would let the impact of this slide sink in. Hi everyone. Welcome to CrabCon and many thanks to Mary and others for allowing me to talk about two of my favorite topics, crabs and sex. This is an illustration from mid 18th century French natural history text uh, from 1798 based on Buffon's notes from his natural history in 1758. Based on the anatomy of uh, dead male and female elephants, this is how Buffon envisioned elephant sex. So anatomy was informing behavior. It is not too dissimilar to crab sex. Here we have the male and female coconut crab, Bogus latro, the largest cenobited land hermit crab, and smaller aquatic relatives at the bottom. The males embrace the female and press their ventral regions together and the males deposit a sperm mass onto the base of the uh, legs of the female. That's what you can see in the upper right hand corner, those dark patches. Here we have some more images from a more recent uh, paper uh, of this sperm mass that's been deposited onto a female in another aquatic species of hermit crab, Clibinarius. And you can see the sperm mass is the uh, labeled SPM in all three of these figures. The sperm mass continue, uh, contains stalked structures called spermatophores, which have a bivalve capsule, which is called the ampulla, which is filled with the sperm cells, which are those on the left here. There's two stalked ampullas on the right and some sperm cells on the left. The stalked spermatophores are unique to hermit crabs and to some of their relatives in the Anomura. The sperm cells are also unique in that they are all head and they have no tails and they do not swim. The sperm cells on the left here have a large bulbous acrosome which is used to enter the egg with and at the bottom is a tiny bit of nucleus with the DNA and the other cell components like mitochondria and membranes etc as is there at the base and there's also three and always three arms in hermit crabs. I know most of you will want to see your beloved land hermit crabs, and so here is a typical cenobited sperm cell diagrammed on the left with the large striped acrosome and the small nucleus at the bottom and other cytoplasmic components down there. And all the images on the right 
are the stalk spermatophores of hermit crabs to scale with each other with the five with five species of cenobited hermit crabs at the top you can see Burgus latro the largest and then four species of cenobita to the right of that so the large cell on your left is packed in the thousands to tens of thousands inside each of those ampullae there on the right so what do we know about hermit crab mating here's a quick summary as you well know the sexual pores or gonopores are found on the base of the third pair of legs in a female and the fifth pair of legs in the male and most of you would be able to see that in your hermit crabs if you can get them to come out of the shell far enough we know that both marine and terrestrial hermit crabs mate in the ventral to ventral position the missionary position if you want to call it that uh, we know they do not have to leave their shell completely to perform mating we know that they deposit uh, these spermatophores, these stalk spermatophores, externally onto the ventral surface of the female. We know that all hermit crabs have stalk spermatophores. And if the spermatophores are deposited externally, we also know that fertilization is external, with the eggs extruded from the uh, female gonopores on the third legs. And as they're extruded, they're fertilized by those non traditional, non swimming sperm cells. And then the eggs are then placed onto the uh, pleopods, sometimes referred to as swimmerettes, on the uh, naked, soft, curled abdomen at the back of the female. So this summary goes for both aquatic and terrestrial hermit crabs, but are there any deviations from this standard model? Oh ladies, avert your eyes. This is the enormous, well, relatively speaking, sexual organ of a minuscule male aquatic hermit crab. This impressive sexual tube, as it has been dubbed, is as long as the crab's fifth or last leg. These sexual tubes have been known, documented, and illustrated in the science literature for a long time. Here's one of the early ones from 1849 from Dehan. And you can see the uh, long uh, spiral sexual tube indicated with the red arrow, which is found at the base of the fifth or last pair of walking legs in this hermit crab species, uh, Spiropagurus spiriger. They come in a diversity of sizes and arrangements and have been routinely used in hermit crab taxonomy. Notice these two species are in the same genus, nematopaguroides, and one has a pair of symmetrical tubes on the right-hand side, and the other only has a, a right sexual tube, that's the right from the crab's perspective. As you can see, they emanate from the male gonopores on the fifth leg, that fifth last walking leg of the male. These sexual tubes are found in males only, are only found in the right-handed aquatic hermit crabs of the family Paguridae. They can be uh, single or asymmetrical, or they can be paired or symmetrical, and are usually long, elongate, flexible, penis-like structures. But calling it a penis is erroneous because all penises are intromittent organs that is they go inside the female and remember these crabs are all depositing externally their spermatophores onto the surface of the female and fertilization is external so these organs are not going inside the female so we shouldn't uh, really be using any term uh, like penis although we sometimes use the term penis like here are two genera with different sexual tubes. The small paired pimple-like bumps in the genus Goria pagurus on the left, the purple arrows indicate them, and a larger single left-hand side coil tube in the genus Anapagurus on the right. Note that the stalk spermatophores are all visible lined up inside the sexual tube in the right-hand anapagurus picture, those small white spheres, they're, they're the ampullae 
of a series of five or six spermatophores all lined up in that tube. So myself and my friend and colleague, Raphael Lemaitre, from the Smithsonian Institution here in Washington, DC, decided to investigate the structure and possible function of these sexual tubes. And we're doing it Buffon style from dead hermit crabs. The first one that we investigated was a tiny species aptly named Micropagurus, which has a single large coiled ram's horn like sexual tube on the left hand side or emanating from the uh, coxa or base of the uh, fifth set of legs. The middle image on the right shows the undeveloped right hand side gonopore surrounded by hairs or seti while the images top and bottom show the left hand side with that gonopore extended out into the long sexual tube and you can see that difference in the left hand picture as well between um, the hermit crab's right and left gonopores. Micropagurus is a uh, small uh, hermit crab that's endemic to the uh, Australian marine waters of, this, of South Australia. It's a small subtitle hermit crab. Um, it only has a, a very small size, so the carapace length, which is normally the head length from the eyes back to the end of the, the, the shell or the carapace, is only three millimeters long. It has a left sexual tube only, and that sexual tube is three millimeters long as well, so it's a pretty substantial structure. So this sexual tube is as long as this crab's head and actually larger than the leg it comes from. These images also show that the tube is covered in small hairs or CT and it has an expandable pore or opening at its tip. The structure hanging out of this pore is the base or pedestal of one of those stalked spermatophores. You can see when this animal was fixed, uh, killed and put into 70% alcohol, uh, that it was in the process of passing one of those spermatophores from out of uh, the sexual tube. We later moved on to another genus, Catapigurus, that's Raphael Lemaitre and I, which is a deep water Western Atlantic species, a little closer to home here, and it has a, a right hand side single sexual tube uh, that's visible um, in the larger image, but you can see it uh, at the end of that white arrow on the left hand image as well. Closer examination shows that the left hand side gonopore is undeveloped, and that's in D. You can see the gonopore GP and all the hairs all around it, while the right hand side is extended into the sexual tube, which is long, covered with a short CT again, and similarly has a terminal pore or opening, which are visible in both uh, B and the um, enlargement of B that's there. And you can see on A, the image of the entire ventral surface of the hermit crab, the difference between the left and right hand sides of that P5, the what's called pod 5 or the last walking leg. Uh, you can see the tube on the right and there's no tube on the left inside that little black box. Here's a sexual tube even closer up, showing many of the same features we saw in Micropigurus. Again, there is an opening or the terminal opening at the end of the pore. There are CT uh, covering the entire uh, length of it. And it even has the same wrinkled appearance that um, Micropigurus had. But what do all these tiny aquatic hermit crabs with impressive male tackle have to do with your beloved cenobited land hermit crabs. As I'm sure most of you are well aware, some species of cenobita flaunt some impressive male organs of their own. On the left is a ventral view of the base of the fifth legs of a male cenobita pilatus with an obvious right hand side sexual tube extending across the body. The undeveloped left-hand side gonopore is also visible just behind that tube. The related coconut crab, the largest terrestrial crab, in fact, the largest arthropod alive today, has a set of uh, paired 
bumps, for want of a better word, on each of the bases of its fifth legs. This basal segment on P5, or parapod 5, by the way, is called um, a coxa, singular, or coxi, plural, and I'll sometimes refer to it as the coxal segment. So that basal segment is the coxa, and that's where the gonopore emanates from. Uh, the purple Cenobita clypeatus has a similar paired coxy with tiny extensions very unlike Cenobita perlatus. But let's take a little closer look at all of these structures on a couple of these species. Here's Cenobita pilata, uh, clypeatus sorry, with paired gonopores surrounded by complex CD only slightly raised on those coxal segments. And what we are viewing here is that the upper left is the entire ventral surface of the crab, and you can see that last pair of legs, P5. You can see the slightly raised coxal segments with the two paired gonopores on them. And as you look a little closer, you can see that each of those gonopores is a hole surrounded by CT. These paired gonopores are where the stalk spermatophores, full of sperm cells, are expelled onto the ventral surface of the female. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the exquisite microscopy work of several of my past AU biology students in some of the slides to come. If we slice our way through these coxal segments, as painful as that sounds, we can see that each coxy is filled with muscle. This can be seen in B, which surrounds the tubular vas deferens, the tube that delivers sperm from the testis to the gonopore. And that tube is obvious in B, D, and E, and uh, enlarged in C. Inside that vas deferens, you can see three sperm-filled spermatophores, clearly visible there with the asterisk on each of them. So this, go, this uh, vas deferens is a uh, spermatophore delivering system uh, to the female. But again, what is going on with Cenobita pilatus? Why the big organ, big boy? You can all clearly see that the right-hand side coxal, coxal segment is extended into the large curved sexual tube, while the left-hand side is not extended, but it is still larger and longer than what we saw in Cenobita clepiatus. If we cut our way through this structure too, one can see the tubular vas deferens extending the full length of this tube. But unlike the thin-walled, flexible, sexual tubes in those small pagurid crabs, cenobited sexual tubes are surrounded by calcified cuticle, just like the hard shell on the rest of the crab. And this cuticle is very obvious there as the blue ring with the with the red uh, line around it uh, around the sexual tube which is uh, sectioned through where that yellow line is on the left hand side and he, here you can clearly see the difference between the left hand side and right hand side coxy we're doing uh, two sections here through the base of the uh, the coxy the enlarged uh, elongate sexual tube on the right and the just enlarged coxa on the left. But both have a functioning va vas deferens passing through them, so they are both functional. They just happen to be different shapes. This close up shows the central vas deferens surrounded by epithelial tissue and muscle and also the thick cuticle of the sexual tube, including the inserted hairs or CT as we call them in red on the right hand side. So like their pagurid marine hermit crab relatives, the cenobetids have one or more sexual tubes that have the vas deferens from the testis delivering sperm filled spermatophores to the female. Unlike pagurids, the land hermit crab sexual tube is heavily calcified, like the carapace of the crab itself, and therefore not flexible, and the coxal segment is actually enlarged and modified as well. 
But let's think about this. If sexual tubes in both types of hermit crabs are functional sperm delivery tubes, but they are not intermittent organs, therefore they're not placed inside the females, why have them? If all the other thousands of marine hermit crab species achieve similar external sperm mass deposition and placement and external fertilization without sexual tubes, why do these species possess them? What benefit can they infer to males of the, these pagurids and cenobitids? A study on the proportional growth or allometry in Cenobita pilatus with a colleague of mine in Brazil and another AU student might shed some light on this question. We went to the crustacean collection of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington DC and pulled all of the specimens of preserved Cenobita pilatus from their shelves. There were uh, greater than 500 specimens there and we did some measurements of those preserved crabs. They were all a variety of sizes from small to large. The first measurement we made is carapace length, which is this vertical red line uh, on the left hand image from the eyes to the back of that head shield or, um, or carapace there. This is a standard size measurement in hermit crab um, taxonomy and systematics. Um, then we measured the propotus of the P3. So remember, P5 was periopod 5, so P3 is periopod 3. This is the length of the second large segment of the third leg, which is the second walking leg, because the first one is a claw. So that's that red line on the second segment of the third leg on that left-hand image in front of you now. And then we measured the total length of the sexual tube from base to tip. And finally, we measured the width of both the left and right coxal segments. And then we were going to compare them to each other. What could these measurements possibly tell us? Crustaceans, like all arthropods, can only grow when they molt. Their growth curve over time is not a gently curving line like yours is, but it's actually a series of steps. So that periods of growth are brief and periodic and represent the rises on a step, while the flat steps or treads themselves are the longer periods between molts where no growth occurs. The crabs, as you know, shed their old hard skin and then while they are soft skin they pump their bodies with air and fluid to a greater size. The skin then hardens and the inside of the crab increases to fill this hard shell. This means though that all parts of the crab grow the same amount proportionally at each molt. So going back to our previous slide and, and those measurements, so the shield length or carapace length, the propotus of the third walking leg, P3, the sexual tube and the coxal segments should all increase proportionally with each molt. This is called isometric growth. Here is a plot of the length the carapace length or shield length on the bottom axis against the third leg segment, the P3 propotus on the side axis for all of the specimens in that Smithsonian collection. And you'll notice that it is a straight line. It's isometric. The same is true for comparing carapace length versus coxal, coxal width of both left and right of all those multiple individuals. So if growth is proportional or isometric, when you compare two structures on the crab, there should be a straight line indicating that they are growing proportionally. 
But look at this graph. Here, the carapace length or shield length as I'm using here on the bottom is versus the sexual tube length on the side axis. And you can clearly see that this line is curved towards the sexual tube side. This means that sexual tubes are growing faster than the rest of the crab. This is called positive allometric growth. What it says is that an increasingly larger sexual tube is increasingly more important to a growing male crab. This is evidence for some sort of sexual selection, natural selection specifically geared to sex and reproduction. So the male sexual tube is a sexually selected trait, which means it is important for sex with females or for competition between males. We could be getting at, through this data, a possible function of this sexual tube. In Cenobita, at least, we don't have this data for the Pagurid hermit crabs. Back to the elephants. So just like Buffon, all my research is based on the sexual morphology of dead crabs. As far as I know, there has been no published observations on how land hermit crabs use their sexual tubes during sex. Remember, this is not a penis. It is not used for internal fertilization. So why grow a large, energy expensive body part, sometimes as big as the limb that it comes from, if you don't need it for internal fertilization? What is the role of the sexual tube? Are the males intimidating other males with it? Are they flashing it at the girls for show or to attract them? Does it have a more functional role? Does it help during spermatophore deposition or placement? How might this work? If you have to come out of your shell partially to deposit a sperm mass onto the base of a female, by having a sexual tube, do you not have to expose your body as much out of that shell to achieve placement? Is this beneficial? Is it more beneficial to a terrestrial crab than it is to an aquatic crab? These are all important questions that we need to get at to find out about the functioning of the sexual tube in both aquatic pagurid hermit crabs and terrestrial cenobited land hermit crabs. So your land hermit crab community is very well placed with the right training to help to answer some of these questions. You have the crabs in captivity, breeding, and under constant surveillance. So let's get some answers to the land hermit crab sexual tube mystery, which may also inform us a little more about aquatic crab sexual tube function as well. Thank you for your attention, and I am more than happy to answer any questions people have after this talk. Thank you.